Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, we're here with another edition of Wowza Live with our host, Ned Dennison. Go ahead, Ned. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'm an epic marathon swimmer with more than 50 marathons under my belt, and I'm also currently the chairperson of the International Marathon Swimming Hall of Fame. I'm going to ask our next guest to give quite a lengthy introduction, but I want to just I just want to set the stage for her. Um, a little while ago, she did an incredible swim in Lake Powell. She followed that with an unbelievable swim in Lake Champlain, near where I grew up. And then she accomplished recently a four-way crossing of English Channel, which I believe will be the greatest open water marathon epic swim that will be experienced in my lifetime. So, Sarah, I will turn it over to you. Give everybody a little bit of background of your open water experience. Cover briefly your kind of three big swims and then uh, we'll, we'll get into it. All right, well, you'll have to stop me if I get too long-winded or prompt me if you want more. Um, but basically, I found open water swimming in 2007. Some of my master swim team friends kind of encouraged me gently to try a 10K um, in one of the lakes here in Colorado. And I, you know, I hemmed and hawed for a while and finally gave in to some peer pressure. And in the middle of that very first 10K, I realized that open water swimming was absolutely the sport that I loved, probably above all else. I'd been a competitive swimmer all through high school and college, um, but never, you know, nothing special, pretty average. And it was just kind of in that open water environment where I really just felt like I had found the people that I loved and the sport that I loved and um, kind of didn't turn back after that. Um, I did a 10K for a couple of years and then one of my friends here was training for the Catalina channel. And I thought, well, if he can do that, I can probably do that too. Um, in retrospect, now that I know him better, that was a stupid assumption to make. But um, at the time, it was what got me kind of motivated. So I trained for the Catalina channel and then um, did my triple crown. Um, you know, I did Catalina in 2010, Manhattan in 2011, and the English channel in 2012. And then it was kind of after the English Channel swim that I started to really want to try unique swims or you know swims that weren't quite as common or popular and then really wanted to start testing my distance ability. Um, so my friend Craig and I um, set out to do a double Lake Tahoe crossing, which is 44 miles. Um, so we did that kind of as a tandem 13. Um, right after that, I followed up with a double Lake Memphis swim, which is in Vermont and Canada, which was a 50 mile swim. Um, I was the first person to do both of those swims. And then it just kind of grew from there. Um, somewhere along the way, I got, the, got it in my mind that if I could do 50 miles, I could do 80 miles, which is what prompted me to jump in the water for Lake Powell. Um, I came out of that Lake Powell swim, you know, after 56 hours or something like that of swimming. Um, hands were in the air and I did a little jump and I thought, you know what, 80 miles wasn't as far as I could go. And um, kind of simultaneously, I was planning for the 100 mile Lake Champlain swim and the English Channel four way. Um, so, you know, just really wanted to see what the human body is capable. So that's kind of the brief summary. What else do you want to know? This channel swim, you find yourself as the most famous uh, epic marathoner in the world. I assume you got a trip to Disneyland and you've been on the front of the Wheaties box. <laughs> if only. <laughs> um, you know, swimming's not a glamorous sport and, you know, there's been some fun media. I got to go on Good Morning America after the English Channel swim, but otherwise, you know, there's not sponsors banging on the door, you know, Speedo isn't calling. Um, you know, so it's, you know, still at home doing my job. So you're not, you're not turning professional professional anytime soon. I mean, if someone wanted to offer, <laughs> but I don't see that in the future. <laughs> okay. So, so describe to everybody the psychology of a, of a, of a four-way English channel swim. I, you know, most people would uh, swim to France. Uh, they'd have potentially the energy to raise their arm 
they might collect a rock or a bit of sand, limp their way back to the boat, collapse and, and go home. How do you psychologically make that turn without celebrating and saying to yourself, well, it's not actually even 25% done because it's kind of a cumulative effort. This is maybe one eighth of the effort. How, how, do you, how do you do that psychologically? Well, you have practice. You know, I had done a few swims where I had to make a turn. Um, and, you know, in Lake Tahoe, that was the first time I kind of encountered, you know, coming to shore, you get 10 minutes where you still have to be in the water, but um, you have 10 minutes to kind of, you know, reapply lanolin or eat something or whatever. Um, and then you have to turn around. And so from that very first time, you know, I really trained my crew. Um, don't talk to me about if I'm good, you know, like we're just business as usual. We're making the turn. It's part of the routine. You know, there's no like, how are you feeling? Do you want to keep going? You know, they don't ask me those questions. Um, so it's not an option to quit. Um, so, you know, we just applied that experience in the English channel. Um, we were there to do a job and, you know, turning around, you know, one time, two times, three times was part of the job. And there was never any discussion about whether I wanted to quit or if I was good to keep going. Um, I remember very vividly on the third and final turn, um, you know, I'm kind of sitting on a rock, you know, half in the water, half out of the water, and I'm like shaking. And my friend Elaine is there with me. She's handing me oatmeal and giving me some extra lanolin so that I can put that on where my neck where I'm chafing and things like that. And I know like to anyone else, you know, the sight of me like shaking and visibly exhausted would probably have been like, are you sure you need to keep doing this? Um, and to her credit, she didn't even question it. You know, she was like, all right, you're looking great. Let's go. Um, you know, and afterwards she told me, she's like, yeah, I saw you shaking. I figured you were fine, <laughs> but you know, it's just, um, it's just part of it. And mentally you can't think about it. You just keep going. It is, it is an interesting thing. The, uh, the, the team and the communication. I, I saw a woman one time, she, she, she leapt out of a boat. It's a cold day and her mother was in one of the safety boats and her mother said to her, Oh, you look cold. Come up for a hug and a cup of tea. And whoosh, <laughs> she, she was out of the water. So I think one of the things that you're saying is that you know, when, you, when you talk to your team, the, they, they have some pretty clear instructions. They to, are to encourage, they are to motivate, but they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're not, unless you're, unless you're in, in big trouble, they're not to help give you a reason to quit. Right. And I've, I, honestly, I've had to rely on those instructions a few times. Um, Lake Powell was the very first time I had like an epic meltdown. I took my goggles off and everything. I was ready to get out at about 30 hours of that swim. Um, just, you know, I was so demoralized. I'd been swimming into a headwind for like 12 hours. Um, you know, I was colder than I had expected to be. Um, my sister was in the kayak next to me and she's been on so many swims and training swims with me. Um, and she handled it perfectly. She said, I think you're fine. You look fine. Um, tell me what you need and we'll swim another 30 minutes until your next feed and we'll get you whatever you want. And that is kind of how they handled me for a couple of hours until I was through with my meltdown. Um, you know, and it just, it's amazing what a good team can do uh, when they know how to motivate you and encourage you and um, know when you're fine and that it's just a mental block and they need to get you through it. And when you took off your goggles and had your meltdown, did the safety boat head away from you at high speed not to give you the option <laughs> of coming in? Yeah, so in Lake Powell, we had like a gigantic houseboat that had to stay like fairly far away. So um, really it was my, just me and my sister having a sister moment, okay. uh, you know, and as soon as I started, swimming, you know, she got on the radio and said, hey, we need some help. Sarah's freaking out. And so they sent another smaller boat out to me and um, she conferred and about half an hour later, I, she switched off with my husband um, and I saw him coming out in the kayak and I was like, uh oh, he's either going to yell at me or <laughs> he's going to be really nice. Um, I wasn't sure what his message was going to be, but he was nice. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, it just takes, takes a good team to make it happen. And for, for you, what's the, what's the limiting factor? 
Is it the amount of time, the amount of hours you can move your arms, or is it the amount of time you can semi stay awake? Um, a little bit of both. <laughs> um, I think in my Lake Champlain swim, it took 67 hours. And I think in that swim, in that time frame, I was pretty much at my limit as to how long I could stay awake. Um, I was pretty loopy at the end of that. Um, and I was pretty physically beat up. Um, generally in my swims, I really like to have pace swimmers in with me, especially at nighttime. And um, a friend got in to swim with me towards the end of Lake Champlain and it like screwed up my strokes. I was trying to like pick up the pace to swim a little faster with him and I physically couldn't. And so I just told him to get out. I'm like, oh, you're not helping me get out, stay warm um, because I, I couldn't stay awake much longer and physically the arms weren't going to go too much longer than 67 hours. The one thing worse than somebody swimming a lot faster than you is somebody doing a one finger breaststroke keeping up with you. <laughs> that could be really yes. demoralizing as well. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> so Sarah, you were, you were quite public with um, health challenges in the last couple of years. Um, without going into any detail that you don't want to go into, you came back very quickly, um, or it seemed to everyone you came back very quickly. You had your, 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 your health issue, and it seemed like less than a year you were battling it out in Cook Strait, um, which is a kind of a one-way swim, which most people would describe as not quite as difficult as English Channel, although it depends on the day. And next thing you know, you're doing a swim that you know, most people never even thought was possible. How do you do that? You just do it. Um, you know, I was very surprisingly diagnosed with breast cancer when I was 35, um, just a few months after my Lake Champlain swim. And, you know, almost from the get go, you know, I was talking to my doctors about swimming. You know, I remember, you know, sitting in my oncologist office, you know, she's kind of walking me through the treatment plan. And she says, you know, you're going to have to have a port put in so that we can give you chemo, um, you know, and that's a device that goes kind of on your, in your chest and it has a, um, I don't know the right word, um, basically a tube that goes straight to your heart so they can kind of get the chemo straight into your bloodstream as quickly as possible. You know, so we're talking about putting in a port, we're talking about possible heart damage um, from the chemo. Um, then we're, you know, talking about that I'm probably gonna have to have a mastectomy and then, you know, we're talking about radiation treatment um, and radiation through your chest has, a, has the potential to, you know, impact your lungs. So, you know, kind of all along the way, there are physical things that are happening to my body that I have zero control over, um, but I have to do it if I want to live. And, you know, every single touch point in those treatment plans, you know, I'm talking to my doctor, you know, can I swim with a port? Yes, you can swim with your port in. All right, am I going to be able to swim after I have a mastectomy? Yes, but we don't know what, you know, we don't know what that functionality is going to do to your pec muscles. You know, what, you know, how much of my lungs are going to be damaged? Well, less than 10%, but man, you have really big lungs, so it's hard to tell. Um, you know, so, you know, all along the way, my doctors were aware of my swimming. Um, obviously, none of them had treated a swimmer um, who was, wanted to do what I wanted to do. Um, I was lucky in the fact that my oncologist, um, her husband has actually done the English Channel. He's a triple crown swimmer. Um, so my oncologist got it. Um, and she was so supportive all along the way, you know, really encouraging me to swim as much as possible during chemo. And I do think that is what allowed me to bounce back so quickly is that I did swim a decent amount during most of my treatment. You know, there were times that I was forced out of the water, but you know, there was always this drive um, you know, I had the cook straight planned. I had this English channel swim before my cancer diagnosis and I didn't want to give it up. You know, I didn't want cancer to take that from me. And if there was any way that I could manipulate it and, you know, get my treatment done in the timeline that would allow me to continue those swims, I wanted to do it. Um, the cook straight swim was a push. Um, I actually delayed uh, my final reconstruction surgery um, until after the English channel because I should have I should have had my final surgery about the same time that the Cook Strait swim was happening. Um, 
but I didn't want to be out of the water um, for six weeks and I was stable. So I didn't know, you know, what complications might come from another surgery. So we pushed it off until this past November. Um, but, you know, it was something that all of my doctors were supportive and encouraging about. So, you know, it was a good team to get me through all of that and get me back to where I wanted to be. It doesn't sound like you questioned your goals or thought they weren't possible for one second. It sounds like you just kept the goals in your mind and went straight forward. Is that a fair, you know, is that a fair like statement? Say, oh, I would like to say I didn't question it. I will, the first couple of weeks um, of that diagnosis were really, really rough. Um, you know, and I, you know, I was, I wanted to swim because I just know mentally I need swimming. You know, I, you can tell me to go for a walk or a hike or whatever all day long. And it's not, it's not going to help me mentally as much as swimming does. So I just knew going through treatment, I was going to really need swimming and my swim friends um, to just pull me through that from just a mental standpoint. So I didn't go insane. So, you know, the conversations early on were just about, you know, maintaining my sanity um, kind of about halfway through chemo, um, we did an ultrasound to kind of check in to see the progress of my tumors um, and see if they were shrinking and to see if, you know, chemo was doing its job. And kind of around that time is when, you know, we got really good results from chemo. Um, you know, things were looking like really promising. And it was probably at that point that I started to think, okay, maybe I'm going to be okay, and maybe I can still do this swim. Okay. What's next? Everyone wants to know. I don't know what's next. Um, you know, I had always planned for 20, 20, 2020 to be kind of a down year. You know, um, Lake Powell was in 2016. Lake Champlain was in 17. Um, I had cancer in 18 and then 2019 was just really dedicated to the English Channel Swim. So I've had, you know, four just really intense, high impact years. And so 2020 was always, you know, some shorter swims, some fun swims. Um, before all this pandemic, I was signed up to crew for a lot of people, which I was like really excited um, to kayak scar. I had two Catalina swims, an English Channel Swim, um, and we still don't know if those swims are going to happen. Um, obviously, SCAR was supposed to start yesterday, so um, I'm here at home, not in Arizona. Um, but, you know, so 2020 was supposed to be just a year of crewing and, um, you know, just some fun short swims for me. I was supposed to go to Turkey for an Ocean Man 10K. Um, I was signed up to do Indwed in North Dakota, so, you know, just fun stuff. Um, I will say that definitely being in lockdown has um, gotten my brain turning. And so, we will see um, what comes out of it. Um, I'd really love to do a 100 mile ocean swim. Um, after this English Channel swim, I realized that salt water has so much less impact on your like arm muscles and lower back. Um, I do think I, you know, a 100 mile lake swim would be more doable than another 100 mile um, lake swim. So we'll see what, what happens. But I've got my eye on a couple lakes that I might want to get into. Um, so we'll see. There's something coming. I, I'm not done. It doesn't, so. it, it doesn't sound like you're done, and it doesn't sound like you're going on the five <laughs> the five k tour of the world. <laughs> I mean, five k sound great, but you know, there's there's big lakes and you know big pieces of ocean to get my hands into. Okay, tell us about the funniest thing that happened in one of your big swims. Oh, let me think. Oh, that's a good one. Um, I'm usually so dang focused. Um, you know, you're, you're, comp you're competing with a woman who described how one of her crew reaching down to feed her <laughs> fell out of the English Channel boat into the water. Yeah. This, is, this is your competition, so make it good now. I know. That's really good. Um, you know, in the, on the Anastasia, the boat that I use for the English Channel, they do, there's like a break in the railing, um, and there's just like a chain. And like the whole swim, I was totally paraphrased paranoid that someone was going to fall over. Um, nobody did. Um, I can say that my mom does get great joy in it, trying to see how close to my head she can get my feed bottle when she throws them. So, I mean, she's nailed me in the head a few times. Um, 
and she thinks it's just hysterical. Um, <laughs> time she reminded me, I had totally forgotten about it. I don't remember what swim it was, but she threw an apple core at my head. <laughs> she had finished her apple and just hooked it. Um, so I don't know. She gets, she's a great mom, but she likes to throw things at me for some reason. You've got me smiling. When you and I did SCAR a few years ago, I froze some of my water bottles and the, uh, the kayaker, mm -hmm. instead of handing me a fr uh, one of these bottles at the end of the day, handed me the first feed was frozen. So I took <laughs> it back. I took it back to Cork as part of our torture swim. And I nailed a woman with a frozen water bottle in the head. Nice. Was, oh, you know, it was just, you know, she, she, she came up, she came up, she said, you sure that that was in the torture plan, Ned? And I kind of like, oh, no, I felt absolutely <laughs> terrible. Um, uh, it's funny. One of, the, one of the things that um, a lot of people don't understand, and, and you'll probably have some extra appreciation for it, is when, when a swimmer starts at four o'clock in the morning in the darkness and they know that the sun is going to come up at 6.07 in the morning, so two hours away, it, it can actually be quite lovely. You swim into the sun. It, 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 it brings you up emotionally. On the other side of that, when it's eight o'clock at night and you know it's going to get dark at 10 and you know it's going to be dark for a long, long time, it can be tough emotionally. You, uh, I think at this point, you're probably one of the world's experts into swimming into multiple <laughs> nights. How do you, how do you do that? It's hard. It's so hard. Um, I, I mean, I, I'll be honest. I struggle a lot um, with sunset. Um, not so much on the first night, but on you know the second night and the third night when you're swimming into darkness again. Um, I it's hard for me, you know, like seven, eight o'clock, whatever time the sun's going down, I really, really struggle with it. Um, and we have found that um, if they put someone in the water with me to kind of help me through, you know, that hour where the sun is going down, um, it really helps get me through that. Um, and then, it, you know, I always know, especially by the time you've done it two or three times, you know exactly how long the night is. You know exactly the moment that the sun's going to come up. And so, um, especially in Lake Powell, the first time I did it, I was literally counting down. Um, all right, 10 more hours till the sun comes up. Nine hours, eight hours, seven hours, six hours, you know, all the way down. Um, my crew was really impressed that on night number two, I knew exactly what time it was. Uh, but that was because my focus was exactly how long I needed to go until the sun came up again. Um, I also really struggle at like three in the morning. Um, it's the coldest, darkest part of the night. I hate it. You know, it just, you've been dark for so long. It feels like forever until the sun comes up. And really the trick for me is number one, make sure I have warm beads. Um, even if it's warm water and you don't think I need it, it's nice to have something warm in the cold of the dark. And, you know, it's really helpful for me to have a pace swimmer in, um, you know, all through the English channel every single night, other than the very first night. Um, I had three crew members and they, basically rotated. Um, someone was in for an hour, we were off for an hour, and then someone else got in for another hour. And mentally that just helps me not to feel alone and keeps me motivated to go through the night. Um, in, in the English Channel on the second night, so in the into the second lap starting into the third, um, I wasn't feeling very well, I was pretty nauseous. And um, I knew when I got to England um, I was going to want to stop. I just, I knew it. Um, halfway was going to be perfectly good and English Channel Double is plenty far. Um, you know, and I, I just, you know, I wasn't feeling good and I did for hours. I just repeated to myself, you know, you will swim through this whole night. Um, and I just repeated that over and over and over to try and motivate myself to like make sure I made that turn no matter what happened. Um, sometimes that's just what you have to do. Right. Um, some conventional uh, channel wisdom is uh, you, you swim between feeds. You just concentrate, mm -hmm. swim to the next feed, swim to the next feed, swim to the next feed. Um, and I think there's also this conventional wisdom which says swim to the sun, swim to the mm -hmm. sunrise. And yep. lo and behold, when the sunrise comes up, even if it's, if it's still steely gray, it mm -hmm. feels wonderful and you get an emotional lift from it because it's yes. no longer dark. Yes, 100% true. 
that's what on that second night in the English channel, you know, I did the turn, I was really sick, you know, I threw up everything, you know, at the seawall in England. And um, that's what Elaine said to me, just turn, make the turn. We're going to swim until the sun comes up and you'll feel better when the sun comes up. And it's true every single time. It's true. Um, in the English Channel in particular, the tides are going crosswise to the boat. Uh, they're not always behaving themselves. Um, how much confidence did you start out with your pilot, Eddie Spelling? And did it when ever, I, did it ever waver, no, ever? No, never, not for a moment. Um, I went with him in 2012 for my first crossing. Uh, I remember, you know, I was still a new swimmer. Um, I probably sent him a inappropriate, socially inappropriate email because I had never heard of them. You know, you hear about the Orams and the Streeters and, you know, all the famous boat captains of the English Channel and Eddie Spelling wasn't on that list um, of people that I had heard. Um, so I asked him, like, what kind of experience do you have? Um, and in his very proper British way, he was like, I've taken hundreds of swimmers across. And I was like, okay, I'll bite my tongue. <laughs> this guy knows what he's doing. Um, and, you know, so I get over there um, in 2012 and I just fell in love with him. You know, he's, they call him Steady Eddie for a reason. You know, he's just quiet. He's not a huge dynamic personality, but he knows what he's doing. And, you know, he's trained his son and his son-in-law, you know, and they know what they're doing. And, you know, leading up to this swim, you know, I would email him like questions and he's like, Sarah, we've got you, you know, we redid the motors in the boat and, you know, we did all this stuff. We're ready for you. Um, you know, and then I get over there and he says, you know, we've been running back to back swims so that we know exactly what it's like to be out to sea for a couple of days. And, you know, I just, he had done so much prep for this swim. Um, I knew he wanted it as much as I did. Um, and so when someone else is committed to it the same way that you are, and they've put in sacrifice and training as well, like, you don't ever doubt that person. So there was not a moment during that swim where I knew he wasn't going to come through and, you know, figure out the tides and, you know, he landed me on the cap twice. Like that is brilliant piloting. You know, he's, he's one of the best and you should, everyone should know Eddie Spelling's name. <laughs> so it's, it's one of the things that uh, always amuses me in a kind of a negative way is somebody has an experience in English channel and all of a sudden, the swimmer that's been there once in their life is an expert on the English mm -hmm. Channel piloting wind conditions. And with their eyeballs an inch above the surface of a choppy water, they've determined mm -hmm. that somehow the boat pilot has done a bad job of doing something. Right. And I, I usually say to that person, <laughs> from the water, you have absolutely no idea. And if you were standing on the boat, you'd probably still have no idea because it's a Correct. tricky place. <laughs> And the best of these pilots, 10% of the time, will tell you that tide was 20 minutes late. You know, I, it, mm -hmm. the, the, or there was a disturbance of the Sea of Biscayne three days earlier. We didn't think it <laughs> right. was going to influence as much as it did, but it did. Right. Yeah. Sir, we, 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 we always, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no it's going, sorry. As I was going to say, everyone always asks me, what happened in that fourth lap of the English Channel? Um, you know, did they take you in a wrong way or did you get tired? I'm like, I turned early, you know, like it, it does that. Um, and Eddie handled it perfectly. So yeah, the track looks crazy, but hey, it's the English Channel and that is exactly what happens. And, you know, I do always tell people sometimes I think I have the easier job. Um, I just have to get in there and swim. You know, I just have to move my arms around and my whole crew has to figure out where we're going and how to get there. And if I'm sick, what to give me. So their job, I think, is infinitely more stressful and technical than mine in the water. Um, I'd rather be in the water than on the boat trying to figure out how to, you know, make someone's dreams come true. So hats off to the people who crew and boat pilots. Sir, we've reached the end of our time. I want to thank you for being a superstar in the sport. I want to thank you for inspiring the rest of us. Uh, and um, well done on your physical recovery. And uh, we look forward to uh, hearing about your next plans and seeing you uh, achieve. Thank you very much. Perfect. Well, thanks for having me. Thanks.